Um, we've got a great uh, speaker joining us, Adam Trachtenberg from LinkedIn, who will uh, hopefully give us a slightly different perspective than some of the other um, speakers we've had today. So, Adam, welcome. And, Thank you. Uh, glad, glad you could be it's part great. of today's track. It's great to be here. Thank you all for coming to my talk. Uh, it was interesting sort of watching the earlier sessions uh, because I saw a lot of the same themes that I'll talk about here uh, resonated earlier, whether it's sort of Bitly and their sort of use of data to drive insights, um, stuff from Facebook uh, in terms of the using the graph and the types of linkages between people because inherently uh, we also believe that sort of social interactions and relevance sort of really does help drive um, activity and user engagement. So as Roland said, my name is Adam Trachtenberg. I work at LinkedIn. I'm the director of our developers program. And I'm going to talk today about building on the LinkedIn platform, uh, specifically talking about professional content um, and sort of how you can use LinkedIn to sort of really help amplify that, that message. So a lot of people have used LinkedIn over the years. Actually, how many of you have LinkedIn accounts? All right, awesome. Um, and I always like to sort of talk uh, first about our mission because in some ways it's really audacious. Um, it's not just sort of connecting the world professional, sort of providing them an opportunity to sort of have their identity, but it's really to make them, which is really you and me and everyone really at this conference, uh, much more productive and ultimately successful, right? So how do you take that and find a way to use this whole network and all the interactions that are going on, not just to be sort of a destination, but also a way to sort of really supercharge where you go, both in your day-to-day -day lives, but also long-term in your career. Um, and when we look at the platform, it's really how do we let developers take that and have it grow? So sort of seeing the obligatory slide in terms of growth, as you can tell, you know, not many of the two million were there in 2004, but we've seen exponential growth um, over the last couple of years. It's funny, I joined in 2002, and I think it was, you know, 75 million. It seems so fantastic uh, in terms of where they had gone, and now we've just been growing uh, and growing and growing. And I actually even had to update the slide because uh, we had one more uh, language. So what we really see is not just that it's um, professionals who are using it, but the engagement that we're seeing of people on the network is growing every day. Um, and one of the nice parts about where we've gone in the last couple of years is really having developers uh, power our platform and letting you, us, all the professionals sort of really work wherever you work. Right, and sort of a recognition that a website as a destination is no longer sort of, it's necessary, but it's not really sufficient. Or even a case of Bitly, where in many cases people are using Bitly all the time without even really going to Bitly. Right, there's certain parts of people who are doing that, but all sorts of, you can interact with that platform without even using it. So one example is, you know, people are going to CNN Money. They have the 100 best companies to work for. And so it's number 11. That's going to be Zappos. And there'll be you know, interesting like buttons like share. You can reshare the articles. But even sort of using the professional data and professional graph that we have uh, plug-in to say, well, who do you know who works at Zappos? Right? And providing that relevance contextually right in the piece, whether that's social proof or just sort of insights directly being derived there, um, just provides a much more compelling and augmented experience. Because as we sort of talked about you know, earlier, sort of attention is greater than money, right? So how do I make the experience, and every site wants to make the experience, higher and higher quality as, as they go. And so we've actually have over 75,000 developers who've been leveraging our APIs um, over the last couple of years. And then when we look at the value that we provide our members and our developers, we have sort of an audacious goal here of sort of like, I want to eliminate in some ways the business card, the Rolodex, and the resume, right? How do we provide you with a way to get your professional identity and express that in a way that's distinct from a personal identity or any other thing that you 
may have to represent yourself, right? So there's a lot of other networks that sort of allow you to express other sides of who you are. But at LinkedIn, I think we have a fundamental proposition that when you sort of have a professional self, right, that's the self that's at this show in a certain kind of way, um, that's a different self than you want to re may necessarily represent to others in other times, right? Other people that you interact with. And that extends online as well. As you go to other sites and other places, you know, how are you making sure that you're providing the right contextual identity to the application or the sites that you're using and using that data in the appropriate way? Uh, likewise, we really want to make sure that you can get the insights to do your job more effectively, right? And so how do you be great at what you do? Not just good, not just get that information, but really be great, fantastic at what you're doing. And whether that's in some ways because you're getting the right information at the right time, as fast as and efficiently as possible. And then finally, as I sort of touched on, we want to work where our members work. It has to be everywhere. That's not just on LinkedIn.com. That's obviously on any mobile device that you may want to choose to carry or any other website that you go to. And that's really where the developer opportunity is to sort of recognize that many of us as software professionals, right, or even just professionals, there are certain applications that you live in. Right? So maybe you guys live in Eclipse, or maybe you hate Eclipse and you live in you know, whatever IDE is your choice. Maybe you live on other sites, GitHub. Maybe you're not even a program at all. You live in your CRM. You live in some other tools. How do we make sure that, to the point that it's relevant for LinkedIn to be there, because that's where you are, how are we making sure that we're providing you not just with sort of a link, but actually the right data and the right experience that you need to really be uh, powerful in those spots? So when I talk about it, you know, this is sort of a standard slide that our CEO and everyone in the company talks to, identity, insights, everywhere. I like to sort of reframe it and say what we're really trying to do on our platform is provide identity and insights everywhere our, our members work. So at side of LinkedIn, um, and I sort of think this is in some ways a, uh, a fundamental uh, for all platforms, is that they provide value to all three players in the ecosystem. Right? There's you know, customers. Right? At the end of the day, we're a very members first organization. Uh, and if the user isn't really interested, they're not providing any value of it, it doesn't matter how much the platform provider and the developers want, there's really nothing to go there. Likewise, you as developers or any developer actually has to find it worth your time. There's a ton of technologies you can be integrating. Why are you choosing to use this one? And then likewise, I think ultimately the platform provider or the business that's providing it has to find it's worth their time. Otherwise, they're not going to invest all the appropriateness in terms of care and feeding and SLAs uh, we certainly heard about a number of people who've both either been building their own platforms, embodying other, and using other people's platforms from infrastructure all the way up the stack, and they sort of talked about how, you know, they've had challenges using the platform and they need to make sure the platform's going to the extent that the platform provider is still provide, seeing value, they're going to continue to invest in it to make that more and more reliable, add more and more features. If it's not going, then it doesn't sort of go, right? Um, and I really see this as a whole thing, of course, as a nice virtuous circle where it amplifies each other, where the more that you're doing it, the more that it feeds back. It has a really nice feedback loop, and it keeps on going. Um, and one piece that, when I think about this, is sort of there's the three coefficients, right? There's the customers, developers, and business. And often people sort of say they try to make it additive. They say, oh, I'll do this one's, you know, on a scale of one to ten, that's an eight, and that's a seven, and oh, well, that one's like probably only like a one or two or a zero, like, but it doesn't matter. The other two are really high, and when I say you're thinking about it the wrong way, these are really multiplicative, right? And if any of these is set to zero, it doesn't matter if the other ones are set all the way at the top; the whole thing zeroes out, right? And so you really need to know what you're doing and really make sure everything is aligned in order for a platform to be successful, and really pay attention to everything that's going. And when that doesn't matter whether you're in the enterprise, uh, whether you're a consumer, or any types of application that you're building. And I think that's a, a key lesson that I've learned over time. And I think as anyone sort of trying to think about where you're going with social, or even if you're enterprise and you have your employees, right? If your employees don't see value in it, that doesn't go anywhere. And likewise, if the business isn't seeing value, it doesn't matter if all the employees want it. You know, you really need to make sure that things are aligned. At LinkedIn, one of the key differentiators that we have, and obviously you're all on LinkedIn that you know this, is that we have a professional graph, 
right? There's all sorts of different graphs that people have assembled on the internet, right? Whether it's you know, these are click graphs or you know these are pages or these are where interests. Um, taking that graph and sort of filtering it to have the right set of information at the right time, uh, the contextual relevancy is highly important. And what we've done is sort of filtered it just on the professional dimension, right? Now there's a ton of other ways that we can then cut that data to drive insights. And you'll see that even in our own platform or our own products, when we think about things, data is something that sort of scales up and down horizontally or vertically across all the different horizontals, right? Everything that we do is sort of powered by the data because ultimately it allows us to drive the right set of recommendations or insights at that same time. Uh, the classic one that everyone knows about that uh, LinkedIn essentially invented at a productionized scale is uh, people you may know, right? It's that box up in the corner that says, hey, do you know these guys? Do you know these gals? Right? It's pretty easy to do it naively, and it's pretty easy to do it poorly, but to make it that it's always refreshed and it's only showing three people that you're like, I actually know these people and then doing it is very hard to do, but on the other hand, it greatly increases the velocity of the graph and the growth of it. Um, so everything, many things that we do um, is powered by this sole set of professional, professional data here. And this is just one visualization uh, that one of our data science teams put together called InMaps, uh, sort of like a hack. Um, but we sort of will do it from time to time and sort of saying, you know, here, all right, these are all the people who I'm connected to. How are they naturally clustered together? Right? And I look at it and I said, oh, yeah, like, that's my open source work. You know, that's my schooling. You know, that's my previous company. When I look at that company, I can even see it's divided between the engineering side and the product side. Right? And trying to take data that's very large and generate relevant insights from it is, is fantastic. Right? It's, I mean, that's, that's the key. Um, and that's what we work really hard to do at LinkedIn on the professional side. Um, so I talked earlier about sort of insights, um, identity insights and everywhere. And I wanted to give a couple examples of what some developers are building on our platform to do. So this one thing is a product called Outlook Social Connector. And the key is just like many of us, we, we live in our email client, at least part of the day. And when you get an email, email from someone, how do you have all the right information to make the decision about what should I do with that message? And if you already know the person, well, then that's already there, right? But maybe you sort of remember that name, or you've never heard from them before in your life. Well, do you need to reply? And if so, how quickly? And talk to them about what? Right? So even if you know them, maybe you want to see the status updates that they're having. Right? So this is the way that we're sort of taking the identity, the people's professional identity, and sort of bringing it into the site experience, or the application experience, to allow you to make very fast, very informed judgments about what you want to do. Uh, we uh, had actually a developer on our platform called Reportive. It's a company called Reportive, and they had a similar product uh, built into Gmail. And you know, I think the CEO gave me this fantastic example about they had sort of launched by accident, and they were getting a ton of inbound requests, and he didn't really know how to handle it. And then one of the requests came through, and of course he's using his own plugin. He realized like that person was an angel investor, and all of a sudden that guy said, "Hmm, that's probably an email I want to reply to." And through that, they ended up getting funding and it helped them grow. Uh, but that crystallized for him in the moment the actual product benefit that he had been trying to articulate about why he wanted to have his product in the first place. And it was particularly important for him to have the professional dimension of that rather than the personal. You know, if he got some information and he knew that the guy was like a fantastic dad and he really loved sailing, awesome, but it wasn't really going to help him decide about whether he had to reply to that email or not. And we want to sort of make it so that developers uh, building our platform always have that experience to sort of take the identity and customize their applications in a professional sense to make them so a higher quality and better experience for, for all the users. Another example that everyone probably here has heard of is uh, Fortune, Fortune magazine. Every year they have the Fortune 500, right? The top 500 companies. And they used to have a very static list. Here's the magazine. You can read it. OK, that was a good start. But as you go through that, you want to see that, well, companies just aren't companies, right? Companies are the collection of individuals who work there and the relationships that you have between them and also people there. So they came out with a Fortune 500 app that had all sorts of information. It's not just Apple, but knowing that these are the financials or these are my contacts at Apple. 
And so the ability to sort of see who do I know at each of these companies? What is my relationship to them? Does someone who I used to work with now go there? That again allows you to have the right relevant information at the right time, filtering that data and cutting it in a way that's always staying fresh. It's not a stale snapshot, but since people are always updating their LinkedIn profiles, it's sort of always ready. Likewise, um, we have LinkedIn Mobile. It's grown fantastically uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, and all of our mobile products are powered, at least in some part, via our own public APIs. We have other stuff that we use too, right? It's different types of technology, but you know, there's an example earlier about you know, wanting to power your products on your own set of public APIs. Um, with our mobile experience, that's something that, that we do. Um, and really trying, again, to say different devices, different types of experiences, more or less information, different sets of things that you need. The phone experience is totally different than the tablet experience, and both of them are radically different than the website experience. Um, and this is, I think, my favorite chart and graph I've ever seen. Like, I mean, and I don't, I don't know, it's, I, just, I just couldn't have possibly undersold that. But here we have sort of everyday uses patterns of LinkedIn, and this is saying, when do people come to LinkedIn? Sort of different types of traffic, right, based on the West Coast. See, yeah, not a lot of people using LinkedIn at 3 in the morning. But then as the day comes, people are waking up. You start checking LinkedIn, getting your day going. And then, you know, sort of as the evening goes, you're using it less because you have other things going on at work or the time sun is shifting or you're going to bed at dinner time. And that's an interesting chart. I think every site has its own different sets of, you know, time-based usage. Um, but then we sort of said, well, that's an interesting cut. For the website, what if we overlay when people are using our mobile experience? And you'll see that's a completely different set, right? The peaks are off put, the trough is different, right? So when they're waking up and getting your coffee, you're checking LinkedIn, right? Even before you come on there. And then likewise, at the end of the day, you've gone home, you're sitting on your couch, you're probably on your tablet, you're checking LinkedIn and doing other things then as well. So what I charge you is to find how I, you can use LinkedIn at 5 in the afternoon in your car. That's supposed to be a joke. Thanks. Uh, so we can figure out how to, how to fill that one up. But you'll notice that as you're sort of building different devices and different experiences, to us, it even said the product that we have to deliver, not just, well, mobile is different because it's mobile. Or tablet's a different experience because it's a tablet, but actually when they're using it and what they might be using it for totally differs, right? And as you sort of think about trying to customize the experience and providing different pieces, that's a very powerful insight that we had in terms of our product design, right? And likewise, I think that applies everywhere, both enterprise and not, in terms of, well, what are people using it? When I VPN into my site and checking things at night at night, you know, maybe I'm going to try to do different things than, than I am sort of in the middle of the day, right? I'm not going to a meeting at 9 o'clock. I'm probably trying to do other things. Um, so I just sort of found that a very interesting way that very simple data, you ask the right set of queries about what's going on, uh, can drive a powerful insight into a decision-making process from a product perspective. So the line is coffee to couch and everything in between. Yeah, so I wasn't involved swiftly in this particular analysis, but um, you know, this is sort of a very simple way of sort of expressing what people were doing. But obviously, once you sort of get that insight, you know, we then try to you know go and either talk to users or actually take the data and see what types of queries that they're making, um, and then sort of say, oh, where where is that trending? And then sort of trying to build the product experience that sort of helps amplify the things that they're trying to do, and even more importantly minimizes the things that they're not trying to do, right? So I think one of our guiding product principles is sort of simple is better than good. The simple is better than complex, right? And actually, simplicity is very hard. But I think one of the things that we took from this data is to say, well, we used to offer these 12 things, but when we looked, only three of them were actually being used a lot. Not only should we build out those three, but maybe we actually want to take away those nine. So we did do analysis, and that's in some ways drove the new version of our iPod, our iPhone product, um, I don't have the slide here, but there's a, one that we used to have. Our, our phone had about 12 different buttons, different tabs, what you could do when you joined it. And then we looked at it, and the new one has four. Right? Because either through grouping or reduction, we sort of reimagine, you know, what are people trying, what are they telling us through the data, and also what do we think that they're doing, and how do we drive that? 
So having sort of talked a little bit about LinkedIn, the way we think about products, our platform, where things can go, I was going to spend the rest of the time talking about what I call the publishing ecosystem. Um, there are a ton of different types of applications that people can build on LinkedIn, and have built on LinkedIn, um, but this is one that I think is particularly special. It's worked out really well for us, and it's an area that we're very much actively encouraging developers to uh, pursue. So I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive here and sort of talk about you know, the, both the technical pieces of it, but also sort of the business pieces of it and how we thought through it. So just like before, I sort of mentioned that there's this publishing ecosystem, and any platform has to have this virtual circle. I thought I'd just sort of start with that. It's a very high level, but I think if you don't sort of understand the strategic, inter the strategic you know, and how things are aligned, then everything else, product, technology, those are just sort of things that you're moving deck chairs around the Titanic, right? You really have to understand what are you trying to do and why is it working for everyone, and then you can realize the product experience, and then you can realize the technology to enable that. So fundamentally, we believe that you know, as your LinkedIn, we're providing you with an opportunity to express your professional identity, right? I like to view that as telling your professional story, right? And then from doing that, you also want to get the insights to do your job well, right? And how are you sort of fantastic in your career and achieving your career aspirations? And a lot of the ways that people are doing that is you're always reading professional content, you're on different sites all the time, and you want to share articles, or you either want to share otherwise other information about your professional activities, right? It could be Adam is attending Java 1. It could be Adam read this fantastic article about the Bitly API, right? All those are things that I'm sort of curating naturally that's telling my professional story. And as a member of LinkedIn, these are things that I actively want attached to my profile or I actually want to share with my colleagues because it builds up my reputation or I just think these are things I'll find interesting. So I have a natural incentive to sort of share this information and I want to make it as easy as possible for that information to be shared. And that's where developers can play, right? So at LinkedIn, obviously there's a box you can cut and paste the link and we'll make it really easy for you to share that information. But if that can happen on the site natively through a share button or directly embedded into an application, all the better, right? But why does you as a developer care about this? Well, okay, it's a feature that people like, good. But the fact is, when that information is being shared, it's driving traffic back to your site or back to your application. It's increasing your engagement, right? So whether you're building for an enterprise app or whether just a consumer app, ultimately usage, activity, insights, money, there's some metric that you're sort of being judged on that ideally you're being measured on. In general, being able to generate traffic is sort of the first step to getting that. And then relevant traffic and high quality traffic is the next parts that you want. And I'll sort of talk about how our platform is enabling that. And that ties in ultimately to what LinkedIn can do as a business is we provide a platform for really making it easy for our members to share, find, get that information, amplify it, redirect the appropriate traffic back to developers, and also surface that information up to LinkedIn. And that just creates more engagement, which ultimately is of benefit to, to us. So all three of the parties find value of that. And not only are we finding value, almost someone positive value, I'd say almost no one finds negative value, which is pretty critical. So you can pilot and experiment and try out new things. And in fact, over a million sort of different you know, domains and sites use our share plugin. And you'll notice here it's a very professional bent on who's using it, right? It's, there are not articles talking about Kim Kardashian, though those may be trending really well, right? It's TechCrunch, US News, CNET, CNBC, New York, even the New Yorker, right, which is sort of a professional, <laughs> as professional you can get for, right, for consumer publications. These are the sites that really resonate when it comes to who's using like LinkedIn sharing technology. And the number of queries that, you know, the number of impressions that we serve up for this share button is like off the roof, right? I mean, it's a fantastic challenge in terms of scalability to make that happen because not only do you have to serve up a huge amount, you need to serve up very quickly. Because as was talked about in an earlier talk, uh, people don't want any latency on their pages, right? So you need to find a way to get that and deliver it reliably and efficiently. Um, so we talked about how people can put a share button on their page, share button, and you click through and you do the share. But then that drives to just one of the products, 
that we use to sort of help take that data and make it more interesting, right? Yeah, of course it can appear in your feed. I think we've all sort of seen that. You know, your friend Adam or your colleague Adam has shared this article. But we take that and sort of split it on the data. So how many of you have actually used LinkedIn today? Okay, yeah, about half. So LinkedIn today is a news product that LinkedIn has that tailors uh, recommendations for articles you should read based on who you are. So you have profile data and sort of explains a little bit of who you are, what your interests are, what you're doing. Uh, we have information about a lot of the other people that share it. And so we can provide the contextually relevant top news to you based on you know, your, sort of your connections, who is using this, right? You can see that social proof that makes it more relevant, someone who's interesting, number of people in my company are using it, and then using that data to sort of say, what are the right articles that are trending today versus yesterday? What's current? So to make it, so again, you have the insights to be fantastically successful in your career, right? And the advantage for, again, developers or publishers is if you can start to generate more and more of the more relevant articles, these will get aggregated, these will get filtered up, and they'll pop up. But the really nice piece is, since it's not a one-size-fits-all algorithm, if you're generating the most interesting articles in construction, or higher education, or ballet, well, when people in those three industries come, those will be the articles that will be the top, right? Kim Kardashian may win all the time, but maybe not in those various industries, right? Ballet, of course, they care about Kim Kardashian, but not construction. So one of the articles, uh, Business Insider, it's a fairly you know, professional-centric uh, website, they said, well, what has happened since we've sort of turned on LinkedIn today in terms of generating traffic to them? And there's a little graph, you know, sort of, oh, yeah, it's going, a little bit increase, and then boom, up to the top, right? And we really vaulted. But the part that I like that I find is most interesting is that when they say we have a higher number of page views per session, a lower bounce rate, than the site average, right? So these are, we're not just bringing traffic, we're bringing the most relevant traffic. And high quality traffic, which ultimately, that's the type of people that you want to get coming to a site, and that's really showing the power of good filtering of data, right? Because you can throw a lot of eyeballs at it, but if they all just sort of bounce away, it's actually, sometimes people say, it's more expensive for me to serve this up than I got from it. Similarly, a number of other sites have said consistently that not only bring them high a large amount of traffic, but it's, again, higher quality. Um, page views are going up. Other partners are doing it. They're coming more frequently. Um, we're bringing the right set of audience for my match, right? And that's the key of having that professional overlay. So I'm going to walk through a couple different sites uh, that show they use some of our plugins. And then I'm actually going to get into some code. I don't think I've, well, maybe the original speaker gave some Java code, but I actually will have one slide uh, showing some real honest to goodness Java code, because I felt I couldn't come to Java 1 without doing that. Even though I think we've had embarrassed Python programmers, we've had embarrassed product managers, I will be an embarrassed PHP programmer, um, but um, we, all, we all program, and I think a lot of the nice part about the web is that it's language neutral uh, when you're talking like REST style APIs, which most of us provide. But so here's Behance. Um, if you're a creative person and you have a portfolio, this is the site that you live in, right? Millions of people are using this to sort of promote their work and show what's going on. And you know, with LinkedIn, we can, you can register and sign up for it. And the nice part about that is you know, when you're signing up, maybe the information that they need is not your personal information, it's your professional information, right? And that's the right information. If you were to sign up for Java 1 or Arco Open World, the, amount of the information that you fill up in the registration process is your company information, not your personal information. So in some cases, that is the right way to do a registration flow is using LinkedIn. In other cases, it's not the most relevant, but in certain cases, we certainly believe that that really should be the first choice of what people are going to use for register, and then you can use it to customize, uh, professionalize the experience based on it. So you click to say, I want to sign up. A little dialog pops up and says, yes, I'm going to give access to Behance, and we sort of let you say what exactly you're going to give them access to. Right? It's important that members are in control over exactly what their data is doing. And we use OAuth for this, just like some of the other sites that have come talked about this today as an open standard. Um, and then you know, the product becomes experienced. You know, if I was publishing something, when I add a new product, or here's a, here's a new piece of my portfolio, it can automatically get published to LinkedIn. So as I'm just using Behance as part of my everyday sites, how do I get more information and sharing and embellishing and I'm putting my Behance profile and portfolio onto LinkedIn. 
or even just sometimes as simple as a share button. Right? This is actually a product on Behance that I saw on LinkedIn that I purchased because I thought it was so cool. It was like, oh, that's interesting. And I clicked through, and it's sort of the sculptor does wooden letters. And I bought some for my son, and it was sort of like a really nice experience. They were someone through that social proof of this is something I find interesting. I came and actually discovered it, and then it turned into a purchase, right? I don't even know if we think about there was that talk about you know sort of social commerce. This was even sort of like professional social commerce, um, which is which is I always thought quite fascinating. Um, another site, uh, actually, my wife uses this, right? So she does a lot of video work, as what her experience is, and she uses Vimeo. Right, so a lot of people use YouTube, but uh, another one, particularly on more professionals, is they use a site called Vimeo. It has more controls for people in the professional belt. So she's like, "Oh, well, you know, what can I do? Is well, when I like something, you know, I can have that bound to my LinkedIn account, and then I can actually explicitly choose what type of actions when I do on B on Vimeo gets pushed to LinkedIn. Right, so it's sort of in that same Facebook style open graph to say." All right, I want to do things on this site and I want to get them published, but one of our keys is how do I put that person in control of that data and I don't want any surprises. Right? This is your professional reputation. You want to know when when you're doing things. So, yeah, okay, I want to want to upload a video, but and I like a video, but maybe not every time I leave a comment. Or maybe I do want to comment but not when I add a video to a channel or group. Right? So, providing people with the experiences to sort of toggle in and out and then sharing that content back to LinkedIn to get that viral distribution, not only gets you that traffic, but also makes that person feel empowered, that they're in control, and that they can therefore comfortably drive the site experience to do what they want. And then ultimately, you know, it appears in my feed, and it's shared, and then other people can see it on LinkedIn and, and interact with it. And so again, that provides that circle, because then they see that, and they click through and watch the video, and then maybe they like it, and then more people see it, and that expands and expands and expands throughout the graph. And this isn't just Behance, this isn't just Vimeo, it's GitHub, it's TripIt, right? So as you're just sort of checking in code on GitHub, maybe they're saying you know, you're following a project, right? And you're sort of sharing that. It's a great way for me to see what cool code my colleagues are playing around with or using, right? TripIt, another way, I love TripIt because all of a sudden, I start to see when people are traveling to San Francisco, right? I used to live in New York. I have a lot of friends in New York. They're coming to town. I'm sure I was top of their list to, to send a message to, but maybe they forgot. Tripit does it automatically, right? And so here's another way for me to say, oh, hey, we should get in touch for a cup of coffee, right? We should go get some blue bottle. It's better in San Francisco than it is in Brooklyn. And likewise, for me, when I'm traveling, they get that experience as well. So I spent the first bit sort of talking about what is LinkedIn, whether that's how do we use our platform, where do we go with that. I'm going to actually sort of move now to the more engineering-centric part of the talk and sort of say, how do you get your content in front of the 175 million professionals right, that are using it? So developer.linkedin.com is a place to get started. Uh, like many others, we have RESTful APIs. We also have some JavaScript plugins and a series of tools that you can use to get started with your development. Um, you know, we make it easy for you to sort of get started in terms of going about with that sharing experience um, and, and growing and building an application that lets you sort of be part of this virtual cycle, virtuous cycle, and get going. So I just made up this phrase earlier today calling professionalize the experience. I think the language people will, will be unhappy with that. I might have to remove it. But, you know, it's more than personalizing it, right? You really want to make it relevant to the professional who's, be, who's seeing it. And so we have a lot of information, a lot of different ways that you can get it, whether it's people, connections, social stream, and then invitations and messages and contacting, because it is, uh, people are at the heart of, of, of this network. Um, from a REST style architectural view, um, we use REST, which means sort of the resources are URLs. The actions that you take of them are HTTP verbs. You can use data via XML or JSON, your choice. We're sort of indifferent. Uh, you can authenticate using OAuth 1 uh, or use our JavaScript SDK to make it really simple. And the other key part that I mentioned is that we have member permissions as well. So you are always sort of, you have to ask for what you want and the members are informed about it. And from a REST style view here, resources are represented by a URL. 
api.linkedin.com. We have a version number, so we can sort of provide backwards compatibility. And then we have, you know, people are a collection of persons. One, two, three is the way I identify uniquely someone on our graph. Or you can use tilde or me to sort of say, here's a shortcut for the signed in user, because often that user you're making in the call on behalf of is sort of critical, right? It's not just what do I know about, I want information about this person, but it's really what can I, Adam, see about another person, right? Because depending on how we're connected, I might feel more or less comfortable sharing more or less information with you. And then from there, you can say, okay, can I see their connections? Can I interrupt their mailbox? A specific message, right? So really trying to use REST style hierarchies to represent and model the data. And then using the actions by the verb. And so not everyone can sort of do this. This is more of a, it's actually a real example, but depending on who you are, not everyone's posting jobs on LinkedIn. But you can post to the jobs endpoint to create a new one, and we'll turn 201 to say it's created. You can get it, sort of the heart of customizing something, like I want to read that data. You can edit it through put, and then you can delete it, or say I'm no longer put, that job's been filled using delete endpoint. And nicely, too, is we sort of use something called field selectors, which I jokingly call the emoticon syntax, because it sort of looks like a bunch of smiley faces and parentheses to let you specifically enumerate what information you want. Because again, performance is so critical that you take a little bit of time once to tell me what you want, and then we can optimize the calls on our back end and over the wire to just return the data that you need to make the responses as fast and efficient as possible. Because sometimes some data is cached, and I can retrieve that very small subset very quickly. And other times you want stuff that's still quick, but not as quick. Right? Um, our JavaScript SDK provides the ultimate in simplicity. Initialize, you include like one line and an API key. You authorize, you can include one script to say, OK, when you log in, give me that sign in button. And when it's done, here's a handler. Load the data, make the request to say, get the profile for me, the sign in user, get their, sort of their first name and their last name, their connections, and then inject that into the page. So very simple authentication experience um, that you get up and running uh, on the front end, no time at all. And then, of course, the obligatory, I will include some Java code slide here um, to say, all right, if you're doing things on the back end, you, know, you can use the Scribe OAuth library, which was actually written by someone who uh, works at LinkedIn, to say, all right, well, I want to hit the endpoint of people tilde shares to add a new share. I'm going to post that. I'm going to post to you some XML, so let me tell you what type of content that is. I'm going to build that up to say, all right, well, I'm having an awesome time speaking here at Java One. Yeah, I'm going to share my talk on building on the LinkedIn platform. Here's the URL. Anyone can see that. Add it in as XML. Make the request, and then get the response back. So it's very simple. You could, I have a similar one that just uses JSON as well. So whatever you prefer, you can, you can create and package that up. Um, earlier there was talk about uh, open graph tags. So it would be possible that if you said, well, I don't even have all that information. I don't want to present it. You could say, I would say, oh, well, just give me the URL of the page. If as long as you've marked up that page with open graph tags, we'll go and fetch that information for you and automatically decorate it to provide even more detail about it. So our goal is to make it extremely simple for you as a developer to sign in and authenticate with the user make that information and help professionalize that experience. And then as they're taking actions on your site, OK, you can share that back to LinkedIn. It's creating that virtuous cycle. They're building up their professional identity. And then likewise, you're getting traffic back to your site as we're at LinkedIn automatically targeting it through our feeds, through LinkedIn Today, emails, and other products to say, who are the right people who need to see this message so they can interact on it and then drive you back the largest set of the most relevant and engaged users possible. So I want to leave some time uh, here for, for questions. Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, really great to hear a different use case than we've heard already today. Yeah. Um, any questions you from the someone? audience? Yeah, right there. So the question was, when could you be able to move the nodes? In, in what graph? Oh, the in-maps. Yeah. Um, it's a complicated algorithm to figure out how to even lay that thing out in the first place. 
Um, but uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll add that as a product feedback to the team. Yeah. This Java guy, is it also on GitHub somewhere? Well, really, that Java, it's really just a REST style. It's a REST API, and, I just, and Scribe is on GitHub. So it's really just sort of using the Scribe, and I think it's DOM4j uh, XML library together to call our REST style APIs. So this is more like just a small sample for the slides. There's yeah, it's a code. real framework behind it. Uh, you know, with OAuth and with REST, since it's really just making HTTP requests and signing them, um, we don't have a Java, a, our own Java SDK, because most of the time it's easy for people to sort of want to, they want to roll their own. Yeah, Aqua Aro already has LinkedIn. All right, perfect. Other questions? Does LinkedIn have a plan about and So the question is, does LinkedIn have a plan for semantic web and uh, marking things up with uh, RDF? And actually, that's not really something I'm an, I'm an expert in, but I'd love to just come up afterwards and we can talk about it, or I can at least try to get your request back to the right people inside of LinkedIn. Great. Other questions? All right. Well, then, thank you very much. It's really been great talking with you. Thanks, Adam.